illuminate our minds. Father, give us revelation from your throne room. And Father, let us reason together because your word declares how good and how pleasant it is when brethren dwell together in unity. And so, Father, I thank you for unifying this house in your word. And we just give you praise, God, as we go through your word, let your word go through us. Let us leave this place the better for coming and say it was good to be in the house of the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Somebody put your hands together and give God some praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. God is so good. I'm so thankful to be here tonight. This is the day that the Lord has made and we should rejoice and be glad in it. All right, we're going to get right into the lesson tonight. If you don't have a lesson, raise your hand, um, and Lori will get it to you. She's passing them out now. And as she's passing those lessons out, I just want to give us a few announcements. First of all, I want to say thank you to everyone who signed up for nursery. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We had over... 18 people sign up to volunteer for nursery. So give yourself a hand. The need is the call. So we're super excited that um, you guys are willing to volunteer your time. We thank you so much. It doesn't go unnoticed. Um, also join us April 28th. Somebody say April 28th. April 28th is going to be an encounter, a special encounter night service with guest speaker Matt Cruz. So you want to be in the house on April 28th. And then also that morning at 8.30 a.m. and 10.45 a.m., he will also be preaching at our morning services. So that's coming very quickly. I would recommend you look up his ministry and just see what God has done through his life. It's extraordinary. And just come expecting to receive. Also, so April 30th at the Pregnancy Help Center from 6 to 8 p.m. We will be volunteering there. So if you want to join us, sign up in the information desk in the lobby, put your name down on that paper. That is one amazing outreach that we are connected to, that we sow into, and they could use your help. But it's just great to give back to the community. So if you're not doing anything on April 30th, join us at um, Pregnancy Help Center from 6 to 8 p.m. Also, um, on May 5th. Somebody say May 5th. May 5th is our next newcomers class at 9.45 a.m. So if you've not officially joined Willow Church, the way you do that, the steps you take are to go to our new members class before service, um, before the 10.45, so from 9.45 to 10.45 in multi-purpose room A. And then immediately following service, there's a last segment to that for about 30 minutes. After that, you'll sign out your orange card and we'll vote you in at our next business meeting following that new members class. All right. So you want to do that. Um, and then for our singles, if you're single in the house, make some noise. Oh, y'all are weak singles. Come on. Come on, if you're single in the house, make some noise. Okay, there it is, there it is. All right, single and ready to mingle, okay? And so uh, it's fellowship, it's fellowship. Um, if you're interested in being a part of our singles ministry, join us May 19th in multi-purpose room C. Going to be a great time for singles to get together, to fellowship, and enjoy the Lord together. All right. If you got your Bibles, turn with me to Psalms chapter 19. Psalms 19. Um, and tonight we will conclude the book of Psalms. It will be our last lesson in Psalms and then we'll be freestyling. <laughs> We've been in this for maybe about three months, so I think it's time for a shift. It's been good. I think it's been good. All right. And when you have it, let's just stand up and read the word of God. If you don't have a lesson, you can come up here and get one. There's a few more left. Psalm 19. Hey, Mina. And when you have it, say amen. You don't have it, say hold on. Okay. Got it. 
All right, Psalm 19, we're going to begin reading at verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day utter speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is a bride as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoice rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from end of heaven and his circuit unto the ends of it. And there is nothing hidden from the heat thereof. The law of the Lord is perfect. Somebody say the law of the Lord is perfect. Converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than the honey on a honeycomb. Moreover, by by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. You can be seated in the presence of the Lord. And today for a subject, I'm just going to use God's two books. Somebody say God's two books. And so when you look at this psalm, uh, I'm just going to talk, talk for maybe 40 to 45 minutes. Y'all know. Just keep, just pray for me. Listen, I preached 18 minutes a week ago. And it, it, come on here. Jose did not do it. I preached 18 minutes a, a week ago. <laughs> so maybe 45 minutes tonight. You never know. So get your questions ready. When we look at tonight's subject, God's two books, it's basically saying that there are two prominent ways that God makes himself known. Uh, when we look at humanity, one of our greatest quests is that we may know God fully. I tell people all the time, there's a hole in our soul. There's something within us that was created and designed by God for God. It can't be fulfilled or satisfied by any other means than God. And and we call that the God space. And we try to fill that space with everything else, hoping that it'll bring satisfaction or fulfillment. We try to fill it with money, sex, drugs, cars, fame, success, families, marriages, children, all of these things. And this is what I say all the time. Once you achieve those things, then you find out on the other side of it that none of that still made you happy. And so the only thing that can actually make you happy is the presence of God dwelling on the inside of your heart. Somebody say, I need his presence. And so that face, that space or that hole in your soul can only be satisfied with God himself. And so the text is basically saying that there are two prominent ways that God has made himself known to mankind. And it refers to that as books. And it's basically how God is expressed. It is basically how God is revealed. The first way that God is revealed that we see David talking about, we see David basically saying that God is revealed through the book of creation. Somebody say creation. And so he opens up the text by saying that the heavens are declaring or the heavens are telling of God and his glory. He's saying that the glory and the handiwork of God are made known as one observes the heavens and the firmament. Somebody say and the firmament. Okay, so the firmament is a term that I actually want to talk about because when I was growing up, or even many of you, when we hear the term firmament, and this is kind of controversial, so just study it on your own time, but I'm just working with Greek and Hebrew words. But when we heard firmament growing up, we just looked at that as the sky. Mm -hmm. 
We just looked at that as the sky, but it's actually a little little bit deeper than that. And you kind of know it's deeper than that because he says literally in verse um, one, chapter 19, verse one, he said, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament. And so he's talking about the heavens and then he talks about the firmament. So it seems like there is some sort of difference that is put between those two things. Kind of like in the Psalm where it says the earth is is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Although earth and world can be interchangeable, earth and the world are different. And so this is why he says that the earth is the Lord's. When he says the earth, he's talking about what you put your feet on, the terra firma. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. So when he talks about the world and the earth, they're not the same thing. He's saying that the world has to be slightly suspended above the earth. So he's talking about the system. He's talking about the governance of the earth. He's talking about what the earth is governing governed or ruled by. So God is over all of it. Somebody says over all of it. It's no different than the brain and the mind. The brain and the mind are different. So even though they can be interchanged, the brain is an organ and the mind is a system. Good teaching. (laughs) The brain is an organ and the mind has to be slightly suspended above the brain. So it is what governs your actions and your behaviors. So you get your mind power. That's why we call it a mindset. Your mindset is set from zero to seven. And then you operate on that operating system your whole life unless God comes and heals you and delivers you and breaks it. Somebody say it needs to be broken. Yeah, because whatever happens from zero to seven, it is going to have insufficiencies. It's going to have gaps. It's going to have holes. It's going to have trauma because whoever shaped us and whoever formed us, not to say that they did a bad job. I'm not saying you did a bad job, mom and dad, but not to say that they didn't shape us and form us the best that they could, but whoever was responsible for us, their teachings and their training, it wasn't completely based off the Word of God. So they did the best that they could with the knowledge that they had, but it's going to always fall short. So wherever those traumas are, wherever those uh, mishandlings are, bad teachings, all of that is deposited in you and you begin to operate off of that the rest of your life. Um, But the good news is that God can change it. Somebody say, God can change it. He says that we renew our minds by the washing of the word of God. He says, be not conformed to the things of this world, which is how you were raised, thought patterns, systems. He says, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Somebody say, I got to renew my mind. So in the same way, you see in this text where it says the heavens, and then it says the firmament. So I want to read something about the firmament because I just learned this in the last year. Um, It literally says as far as firmament that it is referencing an expanse in the sky okay so you know going all the way back to genesis the bible says that god created the heavens and the earth and then god created the firmaments which is an expanse in the sky and then he said and if somebody wants to get me that verse because i didn't look it up because i didn't know i was going to be talking about it in this depth but it says that he separated the waters above the firmament are you with me from the waters beneath the firmament, okay? Now, that means that there is a sky, there is a firmament, or what the Jews believed was almost in a glass encasing, a dome-like encasing over the earth. Stay with me, because it's deep. Go back and research on your own time. And then there is water above the firmament or that glass encasing. And that is what you see in Genesis, if somebody wants to get that scripture. And then you also will see it in, you got the scripture? Okay, go ahead and read it. Scream it out. Isn't that powerful? Yes, I mean, we really literally read that hundreds of times, and I didn't get the revelation of that until recently. And when you break down what the Jews believe, they actually believe that there was 
literally what we just what she just read in that text. Now, when you take it a little bit further and God destroyed, now this is going to blow your mind too, when God destroyed the earth with water, okay, the Bible says, and my wife actually taught on this a few weeks ago for her creation series, there was water that flooded from underneath the earth. The springs of the earth erupted. Now, scientists believe, we went to the Creation Museum, and uh, they actually had a video that demonstrated this, and my wife played a video on Sunday, too. There was such pressure and force from those geysers that it basically, allegedly, I wasn't there, <laughs> but it burst or broke the firmament. This is a deep teaching. This is a deep teaching. It broke. I see somebody got a witness. You know what I'm talking about. It broke the firmament. And if you remember, the Bible says that the water came from the springs of the earth. The Bible says that it rained. But then the Bible says that the windows of heaven were opened and the water began to pour out. So you had water coming from three places. It's clearly in the text. Go back and research it on your own time. So you had water coming from beneath the springs, the geysers of the earth. You had the rain that was flooding. But then here's that firmament again, which they believe is almost like a glass-like encasing. And then you see it in the text where it says the windows of heaven were open. Somebody say the windows of heaven were open. And then the water came from above. What water? The water where she just read, there was water below and above the firmament. Okay. Now, where do we get this? Because I don't want to spend too much time on it, but I think think this is cool because I literally just learned this. It says the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. Okay, now the word firmament in Hebrew comes from a, a word and I can't pronounce it, but it is basically R-A-Q-I-A. And it means to spread out or to hammer out. In the context of the Hebrew Bible, the term firmament is used to describe the expanse or dome-like structure. That's powerful. I mean, I'm upset because they didn't teach us this in school. I'm, ups I'm actually upset because you're telling me that there is probably, and I say probably because I didn't make it, I wasn't there, and it takes a lot to shift a paradigm, but I believe the Bible. Somebody say, I believe the Bible. It's in there too many times. I saw a big hand back there. It's in there too many times. Somebody's happy I'm teaching this, but I see a big hand, but here's the deal. You are telling me that there is a dome-like structure that is over the earth called a firmament. Well, yeah, that's what the Bible does say. So it says this, it says it's used to describe, and this is what the original definition means, R-A-Q-I-A, -A, used to describe an expanse, somebody say an expanse, or a dome-like structure that was believed to separate the waters above from the waters below in the cosmology of ancient Near Eastern cultures. Okay, so I just wanted to give some insight on what firmament really means. Now, when we look at the text, it is talking about the glory of God and the heavens declare God's glory. In other words, he's saying that when you look at nature, nature clearly expresses that there is a God. Um, and now, why does nature declare that there is a God? Because so many people don't believe in God and um, you don't have to believe um, in the Bible to know there's a God, right? When you look at um, when you look at culture, somebody told me, and I forget how they phrased it, but it's, to, it's, it's along this wise. Every ancient civilization, every culture, the archaic ones, the ones that were tens of thousands of years ago, whatever, thousands of years ago, whatever, however long they were, hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago, they all believed in some sort of supreme being, whether it was one or many. They haven't unmasked any cultures that were in touch with nature or that were primitive that were atheists. You see, that means something. Because we have gotten so sophisticated and we have gotten so intellectual that we have intellectualized God out of the equation. But people who were really in touch with nature, who were considered primitive, they all knew that there was some sort of higher being. Why is that? Because nature points to it. There is too much um, mastery. It's too intricate. It is interwoven. It, is, it, it points to a greater intelligence. When you look at the way that the universe is ran and the 
sun and the moon and the stars. It speaks to some form of intelligent life that this didn't just occur by happenstance. It would almost be for us to understand it if you had a watch and you were in a desert and the, you found a watch on the desert sands, you would know that nothing evolved to just make that watch there. You would pick this watch up and say, okay, this is ticking, it's too intricate, it tells time. This, somebody made this. There's a creator. And so that is how you look at it with nature. So when you talk about the book of creation, somebody say the book of creation, God's handiwork is all around. I mean, even when I went to Surfside Beach, I just laid on the beach not too long ago and I just said, man, God is good. I feel so small. That is because this is the handiwork or the craftsmanship of God. And so it says that the heavens are declared in verse 1 through 4. The heavens are declaring God in his glory. The firmament show his handiwork. It says the days and the nights speak of his knowledge. When you look in the Gospels, you see in the New Testament even this same principle and it says that God's existence can be seen from an examination of the universe around us. It says that Apostle Paul told the people of Lystra that God has left a witness. Somebody say a witness. This means evidence. Um, God has left a witness of himself to everyone in the world. He says, men, why are you doing these things? We too are men with human natures just like you. We are proclaiming the good news to you so that you should turn from these worthless things to the living God who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and everything that is in them. In past generations, he allowed all the nations to go their own way. Yet he did not leave himself without a witness by doing good, by giving you rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying you with food and your hearts with joy. That's in Acts chapter 14, verse 15 to 17. So again, he says that he created the universe and it testifies of the existence of God. And so then he goes on, he writes in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, he says, from the time the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky and all that God made. They can clearly see the invisible qualities, his eternal power. Somebody say his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse whatsoever for not knowing God. Isn't that deep? Isn't that good? So when people say, well, I just don't believe in God, and they try, to, they try to intellectualize God out of the equation, they try to rationalize it, it actually takes effort to do that. It takes faith to be an atheist. <laughs> it really does. You actually have to force. It's like a forced compliance. Because what the text is saying, we're not naturally wired that way. And usually when you get people like that, there's, they are like that because of some sort of hurt or disappointment. It's usually what that is. I've talked to plenty of them. There is some sort of story that you can trace it. This is why it's also good to flow in the Holy Spirit before you witness to people and ask them to where you can actually ask the Holy Spirit, you know, what do they need to hear? And the Holy Spirit can give you a word of knowledge for that person, will give you a door in to minister to them. Because a lot of times when they got to that point, if you've ever talked to atheists, a lot of times they are intelligent. Like they, they actually know the Bible. Like they've read the Bible and a lot of times they know it better than you. Sad. It's sad. It's an indictment. So without the presence of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit working in that situation, I have witnessed to many atheists early on and hit dead ends and I didn't feel like I was impactful at all. You know, because I mean, I'm telling them the Bible, but they have a counter argument. So you kind of either have to really study with how to talk to them or rely on the Holy Spirit to lead and guide you in that conversation. 
Okay, but watch, let's read this again. He says, from the time the world was created, so from the very beginning, people have seen the earth and sky and all that God made. They can clearly see his invisible qualities. So he's not talking about just believers. He's just talking about people. Somebody say people. He says, so if you live on the earth from the very beginning, you are able to see the earth, the sky, everything that God made, and you can clearly see his invisible qualities qualities, his eternal power, and his divine nature. Isn't that powerful? He says, you can see it. We think God is invisible and can't be seen. And in his essence, in his true fullness of his form, he can't. But he's saying you can see him through nature, clearly. He says, he's clearly seen. He said, just look around. Somebody say, look around. Okay, so he says, so they have no excuse. They have no excuse whatsoever for not knowing God. So when people are again saying, oh, I don't believe in God. Oh, you know, I don't believe God is real. I believe that's stupid. They're trying really hard to suppress their natural knowing. There is a nature on the inside of them that is craving and hungry for God. They're just pushing it down. Okay. When you look at... The next part, it it literally says in the text, it says that it's demonstrated by the sun, verses four through six. It says the skies are like a tabernacle for the sun. The sun passes through the sky. And when it says the sun passes through the sky, again, it's just talking about how the sun testifies of who God is. Like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, He says, like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a strong man rejoices in anticipation of his race. The effect of the sun is universal. From one end of the heaven to the other, nothing is hidden from its heat. Okay. Now, it goes on to say in verse 7, um, chapter 19, verses 7 through 11. um, And I think I'll read it in a different translation because it sounds better. Um, It says, the law of the Lord is perfect. Somebody say, it's perfect. It says, the law of the Lord is perfect. So number one, you got the book of creation, which just testifies of who God is. But then you've got the book of revelation. Somebody say, the book of revelation. The book of revelation is the word of God. The book of Revelation is the word of God. So you look at it and you say, what are the two primary vehicles that I can get to know God? You can get to know God through nature, and then you can get to know God through revelation of his word. And I'll say this too, is something about nature too, even when it comes to pursuing and seeking God. It's something about nature. Somebody say something about nature. I don't have a scripture for it. Yes, I do have a scripture for it. (laughs) Uh, When Jesus was beginning his ministry, he went into the wilderness. There's a reason for that. He didn't have to go into the wilderness. He could have gone into a house. He could have gone into the temple. He went into the wilderness to pray. Thank you. He went into the wilderness. She heard my voice. She said, you need some water. He was starting to crack up. Uh, Thank you. He went into the wilderness to pray for 40 days. Somebody say 40 days. So it's significant that Jesus went into nature to pray. This is a golden nugget because if if we're honest, here's a tip on prayer. How many of us have ever isolated ourselves in nature to pray? I got a couple hands. Okay. Isolate yourself in nature for 40 days. <laughs> I had to get the hands down. I had to get them down. So, so he went into nature to pray in the wilderness for 40 days. Uh, my uncle, he was a powerful general, moved in signs, miracles, and wonders. Um, uh, Pastor James Sanders, Sanders Temple Church of God in Christ. And um, it, was, it was a powerful ministry. And um, I mean, I, somebody needs to write a book on his life, basically. Somebody needs to write a book on his life, uh, but we'll go in the wilderness and pray for seven days, not eat, not drink, and completely seek the Lord, totally cut off from civilization. We'll go with his deacons into the wilderness. Sometimes we'll fast so long until he vomited blood, but man, saw the dead raised numerous occasions. Saw blinded eyes open numerous occasions. Saw the, the deaf ears open. Saw cancer dry up numerous occasions. 
It literally just came from his consecration. So came from his consecration. Of course, it came from faith. And of course, it came from the finished works of Christ. You know, but when you look at people who move in that level of glory, there's always something to their pursuit of God. There's always something to their pursuit of God. Um, just every type of miracle that you can name, he saw it on a regular basis at their church. Saw demons expel regular basis of his church. My wife was getting her hair done one time, and the person doing her hair started talking about when uh, she went to that church and she saw somebody raised from the dead. And uh, um, it, someone even told me when I was when he was on his deathbed, uh, we went to go visit him in a nursing home, and. Uh, we, I remember seeing him and his, his mind was slipping, which is always interesting that people that powerful go out like that. And his mind was slipping. He didn't know. And I remember my mom was there. Mom, you probably, you know, I know you remember this story. And um, he was just patting his foot. And it was like he was having church. He was patting his foot and he was patting his leg. And it was like he could sing the words to these hymns and these songs, but he didn't know who anybody was. And um, he just had a piece about him. That's really my only memory. I really remember him. I was probably six, six years old, seven years old. And um, I remember hearing a story that even when he was in that condition, someone had terminal cancer. They went into that nursing home, took his hand, laid his hand, wasn't even in his right mind, and the cancer completely left in a moment. It's consecration. It's your pursuit of the Lord. But there's something about nature because when you look at Jesus, he prayed in the wilderness for 40 days. When he was at one of his roughest moments, he pursued the Lord in the garden. And then we get multiple occasions where Jesus goes into the mountain to pray. Yeah, and that's something. So you see all of these moments of pursuit and consecration in nature. Now, what it says is this. It says the law of the Lord is perfect. Somebody say it's perfect. It gives us new life. His teachings last forever, and they give wisdom, watch this, to ordinary people. That's good. That's good. That's powerful. Um, that's why I like reading in different translations because it brings new life even to how it is phrased. When you look at how it was said in the King James Version, it just says this. No shade to King James, but he confuses us sometimes. Uh, it says, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. So, yeah, you can see where it means that, but it's a little bit different and it doesn't come as alive. Uh, but when you go back and you read the translation I just read, which was CEV, Contemporary English Version, it says the law of the Lord is perfect. It gives us new life. His teachings last forever and they give wisdom to ordinary people. So what it's saying is, listen. You can be an ordinary Joe Blow, nothing special about you, but if you obey the word of the Lord, if you follow God's commands, people will think you are something special. If you obey God's word, it is a supernatural wisdom from another place. And people will be like, oh my goodness, how do you walk in that? Like, that's a wise person. No, I'm just as normal as you. I literally just I do the Bible. That's all. I just listen to the word of God, I understand it, and I act out the word of God. I obey God's word. And so it says it gives wisdom to ordinary people. And then verse 8, it says the Lord's instruction is right. Somebody say his instruction is right. It makes our hearts glad. His commands shine brightly and they give us light. His commands shine brightly and they give us light. Um, when we look at the Bible, the Bible is something that is very much so under fire. The word of God is, is, uh, is being heavily persecuted. Uh, when you look at God's word, its authenticity has come into question heavily, especially over these last uh, 20 or 30 years where people are, you know, trying to convince believers and we are in the book of Revelation on Sunday. And this is a big part of it. This is a big part of it because people don't believe the authenticity of the scripture. And I, I'm sorry if I'm cutting you. I'll give you a band-aid later, but the Bible is right. The Bible is right. Okay. 
I got to make sure I'm in the right house. Listen, we used to sing a song in church. We used to sing a song in church, and I, I should sing it right now, but I'm not. We used to sing a song. We say, I know the Bible is right, and somebody's wrong. <laughs> Just ghetto songs. We will be having church on that. We'll be running around on that song. I know the Bible is right and somebody's wrong. And here's the deal. The Bible has proven itself throughout the centuries. I mean, after listen, what more is it going to take? The Bible literally is fulfilling itself day by day. It has forecast events 2,000 years in advance and hit them with laser pinpoint accuracy. So at this point, if you're saying the Bible is in question, either you are ignorant and you refuse to do the research, or you know and you just don't want to believe. Or somebody doesn't have the Holy Spirit. That's the third one. Because the Spirit bears witness to the Word of God. Here's the issue. When you don't believe the Bible and you don't believe the Word of God, the issue is this. And this is what's happened with all the Christians. And this is why the church is lukewarm. And this is why these, just wait till Sunday. We're going to do this last lesson. Just wait till Sunday because it made me sad. Because I was looking at these seven churches, Janet. And one of the churches had kicked Jesus out. One of the churches had, Cheryl, one of the churches had kicked Jesus out. And he was outside. This is a church that is born of Jesus. This has happened in this generation, and nobody want to look at it. One of the churches had kicked Jesus out, and he was on the outside of the door, knocking, asking them to let him in. It's crazy. Part of the reason why this has happened is because we have strayed away from the Word of God. We have gotten to a point where we have allowed, I'm telling you, we have so, we become so smart, we become so educated, we with all of our degrees and all of our intellect, where we have rationalized this thing, even in the church for Christians, to where we barely believe in a demon or a devil or even Satan. Barely believe in that because it doesn't make rational sense to you. But I'm telling you, you're going to, listen, keep on doing like that and you're going to get a demon and you're going to need us to get it off of you. <laughs> so, when you look at the state of the church and the declination of the body of Christ, one reason is because we don't believe that the Bible is the authentic and fallible word of God. If you don't believe that, you're going to have problems. That's really a foundation. That's a foundation. We believe that the Bible is the inspired only infallible written word of God. Now, here's the deal, and you'll, you'll see this, um, and I don't have the address, but the Bible says in the Old Testament, it says that um, because there was no king in Israel, every man did what was right according to his own eyes. Okay, so you are ready for a shipwreck. When, when you do what you feel is right, you do what is right in your own eyes. I mean, you got billions of people on the earth. That's billions of different perspectives. And how healthy is it when your perspective and your paradigm has been misshapen? And now you are left to reason from your own heart. The Bible already says that the heart of man is wicked and deceitful who can know it. You sure you want to trust your heart? I don't know about you, but sometimes there are things in my heart that are not so good for public display. God's still working on me. Somebody say, he's still working on me. This is what we need, the grace of God. This is what we all need, the grace of God. So here's the deal. You're going to let your heart govern you? No, you need the word of God because his word is true. So this is what the Bible says. It says, every man thinks that he's right in his own eyes. That's a scripture. Every man, not just me, not just you. Every man. Somebody say, every man. So this, this literally means you can be dead wrong, but in your eyes, from your perspective, you'll fight your cause. That's scary. Now we know why there's problems in marriages. Everybody look straight, this marriage. That's why. That's why. Don't look at me. So, so here's the deal. He says, where there's no king in Israel, the people did what was right in their own eyes. That's a recipe for disaster. And this is the issue because there's no king in our heart. Every man's doing what's right in his own eyes. 
And then what do you mean there's no king in our heart? Well, the king has his kingdom and the king has his laws and his ordinances. He has his government. He has his legislation, which is the word of God. So you, you want to say, I believe in the kingdom, but I don't believe in his legislation. It doesn't work. Then what's governing you? Because God has a legislation and so does the devil. <laughs> Y'all don't want to talk about it. I'm not going down that rabbit hole because we'll, we'll stay right there till the end, but I'm going to move on. So, so here's the deal. We got to get back to the word of God because I was doing my research and I don't know the exact percent, but it's something like around 50%. It could be a little bit more of Christians don't believe that the, that the Bible is the inspired, infallible, only written word of God. It's a nightmare. So right there, and, I'm, and I, I it, listen, y'all can come talk to me later. Hopefully nobody is like that here. And if you are, you're just going to be quiet and repent and get it right. <laughs> But when you look at it like that, that already tells you how we got five wise and five foolish versions. Because if you don't believe the Bible is the absolute truth, that's foolish. And the five foolish got locked out of the, the wedding supper. The five foolish ones did. So this is what I'm saying. When, when you operate in that, you're going to be governed by your feelings, by your emotions. And this is why we see the state of the church as it is. My wife started a, a new job recently, and um, she was telling me, because we preached uh, about the seven churches, only 28% of the churches were in right standing with God, which gives you a prophetic picture of where we currently are. Okay, my wife was telling me, she was like, okay, so we were going through this orientation thing. How many was it? Five? Okay, so it was five people who were, including her, who were going through this process of onboarding. And they basically talked about, okay, well, this is what you got to do. We also partner with the gay pride. Can't get away from it. So... So we partner with the gay pride thing and and I and so we go and we do work with them and we spread awareness in the uh, for health because of what she does she works with uh, HIV and AIDS and that type of thing so she there's like you know we're gonna form it and, and my wife came home and of course she told me she's gonna bounce it off me and I was like honey I said listen here's the deal you go in and you educate no people you go there and do your job y'all quiet on that I'm telling y'all, some people be like, no, you can't go do your Yes, you can go do your job. You go do your job and God might open a door and somebody gets saved and delivered. Stop being so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. The more heavenly minded you are, the more earthly good you are. So I was like, okay. So she was like, yep, I agree. That's good. I can go there and partner with them and do my job. But then it got to a point where it was like, Okay, well, you, we have all of our workers wear pride shirts. See how they try and push it? See how they try and push it? What this got to do with the job? I don't have to wear that shirt. I'm not wearing that shirt. That's where you got to stand on it. You got to stand your ground. Because you give the devil an inch, it'll take a mile. They'll say, wear the shirt, and then it'll be another step if you do that. They'll never stop. Okay. So she said, they said, well, you got to wear the shirt and we get on the little uh, float and we throw condoms out to everybody. I said, no, nah, honey, you ain't doing that. The devil is a lie. I said, you ain't doing that. <laughs> now I put, I put my foot, which I didn't have to tell her that. I didn't have to tell her that. She already knows. I said, no, nah, you ain't doing that. Now you're going to tell them that it's against your religion and I'll sign off on the letter. <laughs> Listen, this ain't about hate. People think when you stand your ground, no, I believe in the Bible. That's it. I just believe in the Bible. And the fact that people actually get upset about that is the issue. I believe in the Bible, and here's the deal. These are my religious convictions, and you're going to have to respect my religious convictions. And that's the end of the conversation. And I dare you to come after my job. I, I'm, I'm going to tell it, honey. My wife said, hurry up. <laughs> All five claimed to be Christians. My wife was the only one who took issue with it. 20%. Church, state of the church. All five were born again believers. Only 20% of the group 
which was just my wife, took issue with it. Sobering. Now, here's the deal. It's the conditioning. And that's a sample of the whole. You know, that's how you do data. You can't interview every person that's a Christian, but you just took a random sample of five and threw something that's a normal world topic, and that was your response. We're in trouble. Okay? Now, here's the deal. Because I got to somehow wrap this up, because I said 45 minutes, didn't I? All right, so I got eight minutes. Here's the deal. When we look at the Bible, watch this. I love what it says because it says that the Lord's instruction is right. It says the law of the Lord is perfect. It gives us new life. His teachings last forever. And I just want to say this too because sometimes when people take stands like that against homosexuality, then they say you hate people. And that is a lie from the pit of hell. That is a deception. You can absolutely love those people and you can love those people well. You love them with the love of Jesus that has nothing to do with condoning or supporting sinful behavior. So no, I'm not going to put a shirt on that represents that I'm okay with celebrating sin. And people say, well, well, why do you come hard on the homosexuals? Anybody who's ever heard me preach knows I always balance the table and we don't celebrate any sin. But here's the deal. You don't hear about nobody having a liar parade. You don't hear about a fornication parade. You don't hear about an alcoholic parade. So that is what is blatant, abrasive, and in our face. That's what's in the cartoons. That is how they're coming for our children and trying to recondition our culture. So, no, again, I love the sinner. I just hate the sin across the board. All unrighteousness is sin, and that one is too. Okay, so here we go. It says the law of the Lord is perfect. It gives us new life. Somebody say it gives us new life. So new life comes through the word of God. Okay. His teachings last forever, and they give us wisdom. They give wisdom to ordinary people. The Lord's instructions is right. It makes our hearts glad. So there's joy in reading the Word of God. There's joy in following His instructions. It makes your heart glad. His commands shine brightly, and they give us light. Somebody say, they give us light. Now, when we look at the Word of God, when it says that the law of the Lord is perfect, it says His teachings last forever. I just want to give us a few points on that. And I've done this before, but um, this is really good teaching because, number one, when you look at why we can trust God's Word, why God's Word is perfect, why God's Word passes the test throughout history, why the Word of God is the most popular book ever on the face of the earth, I'm going to tell you how we can trust God's Word, how how we know it is authentic, how we know that God's word is accurate. Number one, documentation. Somebody say documentation. So there is significantly more documentation for the books of the Bible than there are for any other historically recognized authors and literature, including Plato. Now, I don't have my chart, but I have a chart in my notes. And when you look at a lot of um, historic uh, authors, a lot of historic literature, the Bible has more evidence of its authenticity. And the way this chart is written, it breaks it down by date written, earliest copies, uh, approximate time span between original and copy, the number of copies that were made, and then the accuracy of copies. And so when you look at the Bible, there is more evidence in agreement with the Bible's authenticity and accuracy than other authors like Caesar, like Aristotle, like Socrates. Um, all of these people, when you look at it, I just want to give you the Bible statistics. The Bible was... Um, New Testament was written in A.D. 50 to 100, okay? And then the earliest copy was A.D. 130, was the earliest copy. Now, Jesus was crucified in 30 A.D., approximately. 
This means that when the, the New Testaments were written and printed, they were written and printed less than a hundred years of Christ's death. Does that make sense? The New Testament was written and printed less than a hundred years of Christ's death. That's very significant. Why is that significant? Because when the New Testament was published, there were people reading the New Testament who knew Jesus. <laughs> when the New Testament was written, there were people, this is less than 100 years, so around 70 years, there were people who actually remembered Jesus getting crucified. And if you could imagine, if I didn't witness Jesus getting crucified, it would be like my mom who visits the church all the time telling me when she remembers him being crucified. It's too close. It cannot be made up. It cannot be fictitious because there were people who would have refuted these writings and they would have looked at it as a heretical book with no credibility. These are common sense things that all you got to do is look them up and you'll be able to find them. There were too many witnesses. There were too many eyewitnesses that would have literally refuted and overturned it and come out with some other counter writing. We have none of that. All we have is that the New Testament church exploded like it was on fire because it was. That's all you have. So the evidence and the fruitfulness of the Bible is there. Now watch this, the New Testament, there were there were 5,600 copies of the New Testament made in its early years that were uh, recovered. Okay, 5,600. Uh, 5,686 Greek manuscripts to be exact. What this means is when you have a lot of different copies, because they didn't have copy machines like we do back there, there were scribes. And so when you look at the people who were writing these and making the copies and you have that many copies, what they do, what scholars do is they cross reference check. Somebody say cross reference check to see how they measure up against one another to see if there are errors. OK, when you look at I'll just say Aristotle manuscripts for his writings, there were only forty nine. Only forty nine. But with the New Testament, there were fifty six hundred. And when they cross-reference checked them, it was a 99.5% accuracy. You can look up all of these statistics. This is a lot of information. And I got to get out of here. <laughs> but here's the deal. Documentation is there. Archaeological findings are there. They have chariot wheels from Pharaoh. <laughs> This is, this is not uncommon. This happens all the time. They discover Noah's Ark. I mean, you can't ask for more. It's found in, it's, it's Mount Ararat. Am I saying it right? Mount Ararat. We just went to the Creation Museum. They had a piece of Noah's Ark in the Creation Museum. I got a picture of it on my phone. And they literally took pictures of the ship. It's in Turkey. It's on top of a mountain. And guess what? The way they found it, What's the Bible? That's how they found it. So the archaeological findings are endless. If you don't understand this, just go visit Israel. Everything is still there. From Solomon's porch to the Garden of Gethsemane, all of it is still there. Okay? So excavation sites and artifacts provide evidence that many of the event people and places mentioned in the Bible really existed. There was a group called the Hittite people that were really like a lost people. And you can go do the research on this. They were like a lost people, but the Bible uh, mentions them basically almost like a superpower in a really advanced civilization. It wasn't until the last hundred years that they unearthed where the Bible said these people were and they found this whole civilization and artifacts. And look that stuff up. You can't make it up. So if the Bible has hit this many things right, I think we might as well just go and rely on it and concede. I don't know why we was fighting it anyway, but we need to just concede. It's too much that's right. Okay, um, let's get through this. Eyewitness accounts. Number three, somebody say eyewitness accounts. Okay, so the Bible gives multiple points of view, and in many cases were written with uh, within the lifetimes of people who witnessed the events recorded in the Bible. Um, the life of Jesus. Here's the deal with Jesus. Jesus was a real historical person. 
So people who are not Christians believe that Jesus Christ existed. So there are secular writings, and I've talked about this before, where people who were not um, writers of the Bible, they write about Jesus. And the things that they write about Jesus are congruent with the word of God. Um, and I don't have all of that information on that, but if you want it, I can send it to you. I've preached it before in biblical worldview, if you want to go back and look up that series. But um, Josephus, they wrote writings about Jesus, basically about how he was a rebel and how he was very influential and almost had a cult following and was causing a lot of disturbance. That would be our Jesus. <laughs> cult following. You know, edgy. I mean, I don't care what nobody say. If Jesus was pastoring churches today, y'all kill him again. A hundred percent. You kill him again. There's just no way around that because that is how Jesus' ministry was. Jesus' ministry was radical. It was edgy. He pushed the envelope. He walked on the borders. He shook up the religious crowd. He talked about the religious church and he did not filter his mouth. Now read what Jesus said to the Pharisees in the message translation. <laughs> he didn't filter it. And that's why they tried to kill him. They tried to kill him multiple times. Keecher, one time they tried to throw him off the cliff. Here's a supernatural. And he disappeared through the crowd. And they couldn't even detect him. They were pressing in on him before the cross because he was talking so crazy, saying stuff like, your sins are forgiven. Now he knows that that's about to literally go upside their head. They about to all start manifesting. What you mean your sins are forgiven? What you mean your sins are forgiven? Who can forgive sins but God? That's the point. Then he says, is it easier to say, take up your bed and walk or your sins are forgiven? It's easier to say your sins are forgiven because anybody can say that. And you can't measure that. But when he says, take up, your bed, uh, take up your bed and walk, and the guy got up and started walking, then he put his money where his mouth was. And he said, if that was true, his sins are forgiven. I'm God. Very abrasive. Very in your face. I'm just thinking, I'm cringing. I'm almost manifesting while reading this. I'm just saying, Jesus, chill out. Wisdom, Lord. You cannot throw this stuff in these people's face. They were not ready. They didn't know. He didn't care. And so they killed him. Nothing's changed. Okay. So you got the life of Jesus it is historical, and people who are not Christians believe in Jesus, okay? Now, here's the deal. Now, they don't believe in him as Savior and as Messiah, which is weird, but they do believe in the same historic Jesus at the same time period, okay? Now, number five, redeem lives. Somebody say redeem lives. We see the evidence of the Bible's trustworthiness in the lives that the Word of God has changed, and everybody in the house should say amen on that. Okay. Then number six, we see the unity of the Bible. Somebody say the unity of the Bible. The Bible is unlike any other religious books. And this is why, because despite 40 authors writing from three continents over nearly 2000 years, it maintains a perfect consistency of message. It's words point to Christ, unerringly to Christ whose work on the cross was ordained by God, the true author of the Bible. So the Spirit of God moved on men and inspired the Word of God. And he didn't just get people who were highly esteemed to write the Bible. He used common, everyday, ordinary people. He used shepherds, he used kings, scholars, fishermen, prophets, a military general, a cupbearer, and a priest, all penned portions of scripture. There's a law, and I can't quote the law, but basically here's the law, and this, the Bible follows this pattern. One way that um, theologians, so this is a bonus one, number seven, the one way that theologians and historians can measure the authenticity of the scripture is because there are embarrassing things that are recorded in the Bible. And nobody who is going to make up a book is going to air their dirty laundry and say things that make them look shameful. You see? So the greatest example of that is when Jesus was crucified and the disciples were afraid to go out, so they were in a locked room. 
Nobody writes that because we're making it up. If I'm going to make up a story, you're going to figure out about me. <laughs> I'm going to be like Superman. I'm going to tell you like I had an eight pack. I'm going to tell you I have biceps. I'm going to tell you I busted the door down. You're going to fabricate it. And you're going you're gonna to at least, so you don't want it to appear fake, but you're at least going to put yourself in a favorable light. The disciples literally depict themselves that they're writing as cowards. After they have walked with God for three years, they are afraid to even show their faces in public. This was also penned with Peter as he was afraid to even witness that he knew Jesus in front of one little girl. Nobody would ever do that. That's a liar. That only proves that the Bible is true. Not only that, when Jesus was, and get your questions ready, but as Jesus was resurrected, okay? When he was resurrected, the stone had been rolled away. The first people who were bold enough to come check on Jesus were the women. Now, you know they're telling the truth now. The women were the brave ones. This really makes the men look awful. They would have to be telling the truth to write that. Why? Because in biblical times, it was a hundred times worse than what it is now. No woman's testimony would be considered credible in a court of law. Yet they have the women discovering Jesus' empty tomb. Then the woman runs into Jesus first, and then he tells the woman to go spread the message to the man, by the way, that he is risen from the dead. So the women actually were the first ones to carry the gospel message to the men. Women were the first ones to carry that message. If this was a lie, and if it wasn't true, the word of God, it would have never been written that way because that weakens the argument that Jesus is alive. Okay? I'll close with this, and I think I'm just going to close with reading. Give me 60 seconds. Somebody say he can do it. 60 seconds. Okay, I'm just going to read through this, and it says this. It says... Um, Worshiping the Lord, verse 9, is sacred. He will always be worshiped. All his decisions are correct and fair. They are worth more than the finest gold, and they are sweeter than the honey on the honeycomb. By your teachings, Lord, I am warned. By obeying them, I am greatly rewarded. None of us know our faults. Wow. Somebody say it. None of us know our faults. Somebody say, you have some faults. You just don't know it. I think that's sobering. No matter how far along you've come, no matter how long you walk with God, this says that you have faults, but you don't know them. None of us know our faults. So it's going to take um, a spouse that you trust. Come on. And if you're a spouse, they're your spouse, you're supposed to trust them. It's not supposed to be a spouse that you trust. It should be the spouse that you trust. Right? But you'd be shocked. So your spouse should be able to tell you your flaws without you throwing a fit. You are too quiet on that one. Somebody said, well, I can't say it because I'm throwing a fit. I'm the one throwing the fit. Your spouse should be able to tell you and you need outside influence. The reason why you don't know your faults is because you live within yourself. It's just like when I, I always go back and rewatch the sermons. Number one, because I need the word, but number two, because I'm going to critique what I'm doing. And that's how my pastor trained me early on. So I watch it multiple times because you want to refine your craft. You want to refine your craft. And so there's a Holy Spirit component, but then there's a public speaking component. So if I'm not speaking in church, I can still speak in the world. I went on the Great American Speak Off two years ago. Oh, was it two years ago? Great American Speak Off two years ago, um, and that was an amazing experience. I made the top 10% of speakers in the country. You remember that. Top 10% out of 15,000 people that auditioned for that. It was in the top 150. But that is because you work and you refine your craft. And then there's another component, because even over there on the secular side, because I'm like, honey, I think I might need to pursue this public speaking, because the anointing will still come over there. You don't, the anointing is not really for the church, it's really for the world. So like, I felt the presence of God when I was talking about secular topics. It just is what it is. And after I got off stage, somebody said, can you pray for me? 
Wasn't even talking about God. Yeah. It works. It really works. So the deal is, is that ultimately, I don't even know what I'm talking about, but I said this. No, I know what I'm talking about. You got to be outside of yourself. When I used to listen to myself early, I used to hate how I sounded. I said, I cannot stand to listen to myself. I really sound like that? That's proving the scripture. No one is aware of their faults. So my voice was messed up to hear it, but I was talking normal and I was cool while I was saying it. But when I got outside of myself and watched the video, it was disgusting. Like I really, my hand gestures are like that. I use my hands that much. Yeah, you do. But God uses the hands. You know, it tells the story. But it's like that in every facet of your life. You have to allow somebody on the outside to be able to give you instruction. That's it. Lesson open to the class.